Audiobook titled DC Phantom Thief Kid Chapter 42-46 by Sithask. This work belongs to author Sithask. Source Scribblehub.com. Chapter 42 Difficulty The best way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Walt Disney. A few days later, Phantom Thief's notice reappears. Can he continue to write his own legendary tale after successfully completing two perfect crimes? What's the difference between a thief and a phantom thief? Looking at the phantom thief's two crimes, the first one was where the stolen tears of an angel were successfully returned and are now displayed in the art museum. The second one was where he stole the fake made pink fantasy, providing key evidence to expose the underground money laundering operation. This makes us wonder, is phantom thief really guilty? In these days, some citizens of Gotham have been influenced by Phantom Thief's actions. With some even forming their own fan clubs, there are also people who dress up like the Phantom Thief and participate in street parades. Only for the GCPD to catch them, this means that a trend of admiring the Phantom Thief is silently rising in Gotham. Whether this situation is good or bad, we do not know. Why does Phantom Thief steal? According to psychological experts, there are rumors that the exhibition of the dragon's egg ruby necklace is organized by the infamous Oswald Cobblepot, also known as Penguin, in order to exact revenge for the phantom thief disrupting his money laundering business and the pink fantasy incident is the battle between phantom thief and penguin real or fake? Let's wait and see. Slam. GCPD headquarters, commissioner's office. Jim Gordon angrily slams a few newspapers on the desk, his face dark as if it could drip water. Calm down. Jim why are you getting so worked up over nothing? Beside him, Harvey Bullock calmly tries to console him. Phantom Thief is just going to return whatever he stole anyway. Or the thing he stole was something worthless like a glass bead it hasn't caused any real economic damage to anyone I think we don't need to put so much energy into him just send. A few new officers over to show that we're paying attention. Harvey, how can you say something like that? As soon as Jim hears Harvey's careless words, his expression becomes even more unpleasant. Do you even know what I'm worried about? The phantom thief has only appeared for a short time, and already people are imitating him right now, they're just imitating his clothes. But who knows if in the future someone will steal in order to further imitate phantom thief. As the commissioner of the Gotham City Police Department, Gordon actually has his own separate office and doesn't need to be around the frontline detectives. However, Jim himself started as a detective, and he wants Gotham City to change at least a little bit. So even after becoming commissioner, he remains in the GCPD building and always rushes to the front lines whenever there's a case. This is also something that many people don't understand. Why would Commissioner Gordon personally handle a simple theft case and pay so much attention to the Phantom Thief? Yes, the Phantom Thief follows his own set of codes, but what about others? Could people be using the Phantom Thief's name to extort and deceive others? Never underestimate the moral bottom line of Gotham people. That was something you told me before. Jim stared at Harvey with wide eyes. No matter if the phantom thief returns the stolen items or not, he is still a criminal. And when citizens start idolizing a criminal, that's the beginning of the chaos. Don't tell me you've forgotten everything that happened over a decade ago. We can't let a criminal have a huge public influence again. Faced with Jim's emotionally charged outbursts, Harvey gave an awkward grin and apologized quickly. All right, all right, I admit you have a point. I have realized the problems with Phantom Thief's growing influence, but should we discuss something else now? Harvey took out a piece of A4 paper with the contents of the Phantom Thief's latest letter on it and placed it on the table with a serious expression. Tomorrow is the first day of the exhibition. If we can't decipher the notice on this today, then we'll have to guard the exhibition tightly for 15 straight days. The GCPD doesn't have the resources to waste this much money. Jim knew Harvey wasn't making things up. There were too many criminal activities in different districts of Gotham, and many police personnel were needed everywhere. In all of Gotham, the total number of police officers of different types exceeded 30,000, but even after being evenly distributed across all precincts, there wasn't enough manpower. Currently, they are not too busy, but the entire Gotham had only about a thousand police officers who could be dispatched, and only a small number of those were elite detectives. These 1,000 officers had to be ready to assist in any serious cases that might happen somewhere. It was impossible to call all of them to deal with the phantom thief. It was particularly important to decipher the notice in advance, especially to get the time of the phantom thief's crime, as it could save many police resources. Jim calmed himself down, 
picked up the notice that Phantom Thief had faxed to the police station a few days ago, and furrowed his brow. If 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4, then I will visit at a non-existent time, when Mars has passed its tenth day and night, following the guidance of Caesar, I shall come to claim the blood-stained egg. Sincerely, Phantom Thief. Just this first sentence had puzzled Jim for several days. What does it mean for 20 multiplied by 3 to equal 4 foot? Shouldn't it be 60? At what time does that not exist? Doesn't it always mean that there is still an hour between 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock? And what about following the guidance of Caesar? Does it mean that the phantom thief has traveled through time? Or has Julius Caesar traveled through time? Could Julius Caesar appear out of nowhere to guide the phantom thief? Except for the last sentence, which is about the dragon's egg ruby necklace. The rest of the lines seem like they have 9 out of 10 blocked with just one hole open. At the GCPD, Jim was completely clueless about the notice. On the other side is Wayne Manor, the Batcave. Dick was also pondering how to decipher the Phantom Thief's notice letter. Somehow, he felt that Phantom Thief's ability to write these notices was getting stronger, and each puzzle was more difficult to solve than the last. He looked through a lot of math research reports and academic papers on the back computer, trying to find an explanation for why 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4. If 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4 this sentence must be the key to unlocking the notice letter. Dick firmly believed. But the question remained, under what circumstances would 20 multiplied by 3 equal 4? He studied all mathematical theories and even found many arguments that 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. But he couldn't find any logical explanation for why 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4. There were only two possibilities. First, Phantom Thief made a mistake. But that was clearly impossible. After ruling out all the possibilities, Dick arrived at the final truth. This. It's not a mathematical problem at all. At the same time, at the Gotham City Public Library, Barbara looked at the content of the notice, and a glimmer of excitement quietly appeared in her eyes. Author's note. Give me power stones so that we can reach heaven. Patreon.com slash Sothisk. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 5. Chapter 43. First day of the exhibition. Hurt me with the truth but never comfort me with a lie. Urza Scarlet, Fairy Tale. The sentence that reads, 20 times 3 equals 4, is what most people notice when they look at Phantom Thief's notice letter. They think that if they can figure out this sentence, they will be able to figure out all of the notice's clues. However, Barbara had a different perspective. When she couldn't figure out why 20 multiplied by 3 would equal 4, it meant that there was still another extra puzzle hidden within the sentence itself. In other words, it wasn't important whether 20 multiplied by 3 would equal 4. What's important is what these three numbers. 20, 3, and 4, represent. And what does the word multiply represent? Barbara shifted her focus to the third and fourth sentences of the notice. Mars and Caesar, one is the god of war in Roman mythology, and the other is the dictator of the Roman Empire Rome Rome Rome. After pondering for a while, Barbara suddenly remembered the introduction to Greco-Roman polytheism in the religious section of the library. And she also remembered Dean Sutton from the last time she saw him at the library reading it. Could it be a coincidence? Barbara thought suspiciously. I didn't think there was anything unusual when we met last time. But now that I think about it, why would a young magician prodigy be interested in Greco-Roman religious studies? The more she thought about it, the more something seemed off. Barbara's gaze sharpened as she headed to the bookshelf where she had met Dean before, took out the research introduction, and flipped through it. However, after a quick scan, besides information about the Roman god of war, Mars, Barbara did not find any relevant clues to decipher the notice. It seems like I'm just being paranoid he couldn't possibly. Barbara chuckled and placed the book back on the shelf. Hmm? Just then, the corner of Barbara's eye caught sight of another book on the shelf. The Negative Impact of the European Church on Cultural Development On March 1st, the first day of the Dragon's Egg Ruby Necklace Exhibition. The exhibition venue was the Gotham Natural History Museum. This was the city's biggest museum with 13 exhibition halls that all connected to each other, each with five floors and dozens of large exhibition rooms. Mrs. Chandler's necklace was placed on the top floor of the Central Cultural Exhibition Hall. Today, there were more visitors to the museum than usual. In the past, there were almost no visitors now that it has only been open for two hours, it has already shown signs of a huge crowd. It's unclear whether it was because of the Dragon's Egg Ruby necklace due to its fame and everyone wanted to see what it looked like, or if it was because they wanted to see how Phantom Thief would steal the necklace. 
Over 200 undercover officers from the GCPD kept close watch around the cultural exhibition hall, monitoring every visitor who came. Inside the exhibition hall, nearly a hundred police officers were spread out at different locations on the five floors. The show of control was pretty impressive, and even visitors followed the rules without even thinking about it. In addition to the cultural exhibition hall, the other exhibition halls also had different numbers of officers assigned to them to act as a roaming task force for timely support. If needed, this time, the GCPD sent out more people than they ever had before but Jim still didn't think it was safe enough. They temporarily brought in two police helicopters to patrol the museum. If Phantom Thief tried to surprise them with a glider, the helicopter rotor's airflow would teach him a lesson. However, this time, the police didn't use the face-squeezing method to verify if the visitors were pretending to be Phantom Thief. The exhibition would last for 15 days, and they couldn't be sure when the Phantom Thief would sneak in. If they squeezed every visitor's face for 15 days in a row, it would cause public dissatisfaction. If handled poorly, it could even lead to a fight. This is definitely not the situation Jim wants to see. Therefore, the police could only work hard on surveillance. At this moment, a beautiful young redhead girl walked into the Natural History Museum. As she entered the square, she spotted a familiar figure wearing a cowboy hat leading a patrol team. Hey, Harvey. Barbara walked over and greeted Harvey. Oh, hey, Barbara. Are you here to visit your Uncle Harvey? Harvey turned around and smiled happily when he heard Barbara's voice. He had known Jim for many years and had watched Barbara grow up. For some reason, he was still single, and deep down, he might have considered Barbara his own daughter. I'd love to humor you and say yes, but I'm sorry, that's not why I'm here. I came for one purpose only, and that is to see Phantom Thief. Barbara teased playfully, blinking her eyes. Hush. Suddenly, Harvey made a gesture to silence her and exaggeratedly said, Be careful don't let your dad hear your words he's so sick of Phantom Thief. It's driving him nuts. Don't worry, Uncle Harvey. I know very well how much my dad hates Phantom Thief. I suspect if he wasn't afraid of being reported for disturbing the quiet at night, he would spend the whole night criticizing Phantom Thief. Barbara chuckled in amazement. Anyway, I'm going to go to the exhibition and see what Phantom Thief wants to steal, so I won't bother you to continue patrolling. After separating from Harvey and others, Barbara's mischievous and cute smile vanished in an instant, replaced by seriousness and determination. She calmly took out an earphone and put it on, and a slightly eager voice came through. Have you entered the museum? Obviously, yes. At the same time, in the senior year classroom of Gotham Academy, Dick wore a pair of earphones in his ears. He was having a hidden conversation with Barbara, and he was doing it in the middle of a class. Gotham's private high school was relatively open-minded and did not exactly restrict students from using electronic devices. It was normal to see students wearing earphones and using phones, tablets, and even laptops in class. As long as the students believed that these devices improved their learning efficiency, they were allowed. However, the condition was that when the teacher called on you to answer a question, you had to be able to provide an accurate answer instead of being clueless. Otherwise, it would be seen as a disrespectful attitude towards learning, and your electronic devices would be confiscated on the spot. Therefore, Dick's wearing earphones in the classroom didn't draw much attention. He kept his voice very low, just enough for Barbara and himself to hear, while everyone else around couldn't hear what he was saying. Even Dean, who was sitting in front of him, couldn't hear his voice with his ears. But the interesting thing is that Dean also wears an earphone on his left ear. Author's note. Patreon.com slash Sothisk. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 4. Chapter 44 Suspicion Even if we forget the faces of our friends, we will never forget the bonds that were carved into our souls. Yuzuru Otanashi, Angel Beats In the back row near the window, Dean listened to the faint voice coming through his earphones and thought to himself. Dick sent someone to the museum. How could Dean hear Dick's conversation? In fact, the method was quite simple. All Dean had to do was crack the electromagnetic frequency that matched Dick and Barbara's phone call, and with a set of techniques, he could easily listen in on conversations. Of course, Dean didn't have that level of hacking expertise yet, and he didn't have the important tools at the moment. In fact, Dean had installed a small bug that looked like a piece of gum on the opposite side of Dick's desk. It was not the first day for Dean to eavesdrop on Dick. As early as the day he appeared as the Phantom Thief, Dean had already started to keep a close eye on Dick. He would come to school early in the morning to install the bug and bring it back after school. 
It was a very bold and risky move. Once Dick finds out about the bug, or if Dick has some strange habit of touching under the desk, the situation will be very bad for Dean. But on the other hand, Dean knew that so far Dick had still trusted him up to this point. And over the years of knowing each other, Dean had never seen Dick check under the desk. Even if Dick accidentally found the bug, Dean could come up with a prank with sticky gum to gamble his way out, although it would be difficult. In short, Dean thought it was worth the risk to learn about Dick's secret life as Robin, even if there was only a small chance that he could learn something useful. As it turned out, Dean was more right in his bet. Who was Dick talking to, Alfred? Unfortunately, the bug only picked up Dick's voice and not the voices in his earpiece. Dean stayed quiet and seemed to pay attention in class, but he was really focusing on Dick. On the other side, Barbara casually walked around the exhibition as an ordinary visitor. Did you figure out the riddle already that you were so eager for me to come to the museum and investigate? Barbara quietly asked Dick. I've only deciphered one part. Dick paused for a moment, then answered. When Mars has passed its tenth day, it means that Phantom Thief will move on March 11th. Mars, the god of war in Roman mythology, is the origin of the word March after past its tenth day. It means exactly ten days, which is March 11th. Barbara wasn't surprised that Dick had deciphered this line as she had also deciphered it, and even more than what Dick had solved. You know that Phantom Thief won't move until the 11th, so why did you ask me to come on the first day? Don't you know how busy I am with work every day? Dick twitched the corners of his mouth as if he had never been to the library he pretended not to hear and continued. I've fought with Phantom Thief twice before although he waits until the set time. It doesn't mean that he will only come to the scene at that time. Phantom Thief's every move is fast and accurate with a strong purpose, and his escape routes are all planned, which shows that he is very familiar with the location this much information can't be learned in just a few hours. Dick said earnestly, I'm sure Phantom Thief starts observing the target location several days or even weeks before he takes action. Today is the first day of the exhibition and also the first day that GCPD has settled in a large area the Phantom Thief is likely to observe the police positions from this point. You might be able to find some clues. I still have three days of classes before I can have a two-day break so it's difficult for me to leave and go to the museum. So you want me to come? It seems like you've learned some lessons from dealing with Phantom Thief. After hearing Dick's words, Barbara finally understood why this kid asked her to come to the museum early in the morning. There's actually a more important reason. At this moment, Dick suddenly spoke with a serious tone. During the auction at Gotham International Hotel, Phantom Thief sent me a challenge card to Robin. But at that time, I was Dick Grayson, not Robin. Upon hearing this, Barbara's expression changed suddenly. Are you saying that the Phantom Thief knows who you are? Why didn't you tell me this important information earlier? You should have told me that day. What about Bruce and Alfred? What about me? Have we all been exposed? Dick said in a deep voice. Honestly, I'm not sure at least Phantom Thief hasn't used our identities to threaten us or shown any signs of revealing this information to others I. Don't think he's a completely bad person. Listening to Dick's words, Barbara couldn't help but think of Dean. She suddenly asked, Dick, do you know Dean Sutton? Dean? He's my classmate, why do you bring him up? Dick asked in confusion. I ran into him at the library a few days ago, and he was reading works on Greek and Roman religions now the new notice letter from Phantom Thief clearly has Roman parts in. Addition, he's a young and famous magician, don't you think it's too much of a coincidence? Barbara whispered. You suspect Dean is the Phantom Thief? Dick raised an eyebrow and chuckled, I know Dean, and he couldn't possibly do those things. At that moment, sitting at the table in front of Dick, Dean suddenly felt a sense of guilt for some reason. Hmm, I guess it's because I've been eating too many carbs and fats lately. I need to maintain a low body fat percentage. After making a decision in his heart, Dean continued eavesdropping on Dick's conversation. I know you're friends with Dean, and honestly... I don't have a bad impression of him I don't want to suspect him, but it's just too coincidental. Barbara suggested to Dick, we both don't want Dean to be the phantom thief, so I've decided to give you an important task it's not because I suspect him, but to prove Dean's innocence. After hearing Barbara's suggestion, Dick hesitated a bit on his face, but in the end, Barbara's suspicion was reasonable. Alright, I agree with your idea. Dick wasn't a hesitant person, so once he figured things out, he immediately agreed. Don't worry, we won't wrongly accuse anyone who's innocent by the way. At this moment, Barbara asked with a playful look in her eyes, 
Do you want to know the real meaning behind 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4 foot? Author's note. Keep supporting me guys and drop power stone. We will reveal the answer tomorrow. Enjoy. Patreon.com slash Sothisk. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 6. Chapter 45. The meaning of the notice letter. What's the point of living, if all we do is hurt each other? Thorfinn, Vinland Saga. When Dick heard Barbara's words, his pupils instantly shrank. You mean to say you've already figured it out? Dick asked anxiously. Well, what do you think? If I hadn't figured it out, wouldn't it be meaningless for me to ask you? Barbara smirked and said, You must be racking your brains to solve the riddle in the notice. And you can't wait to know what it means, am I right? Stop teasing me, just tell me already. Dick urged impatiently. Seeing that he was in such a hurry, Barbara stopped teasing and became serious. Do you know Roman numerals? Roman numerals? Of course, I know them, but what does that have to do with the riddle in the notice letter? Dick scowled and questioned. But even using Roman counting, 20 multiplied by 3 still doesn't equal 4. That's because the real values of 20, 3, and 4 are not what they appear to be. They may not represent specific numbers, but rather an order of numbers, Barbara explained. An order of numbers? Dick questioned. Barbara reminded him. Do you still remember the seven basic symbols of Roman numerals? I1, V5, X10, L50, C100, D500, M1000, and so on. As Dick recalled these seven symbols, a flash of ideas came to him. If we consider 20, 3, and 4 as an order of numbers in alphabetical letters, it means we need to convert them into the matching letters and then replace them into the Roman numerals, hmm? Wait, that doesn't make sense. Just as he was halfway through the idea, a puzzled expression appeared on Dick's face. If we solve them based on alphabetical numbers, then 3 as C would be equal to 100, and 4 as D would be equal to 500 but 20 as T, which isn't one of the basic symbols of Roman numerals. Hearing this, Barbara's eyes flashed, and she said it meaningfully. According to Roman mythology, Polytheism is considered traditional and was slowly replaced by Christianity starting from the time of Constantine the Great it became a remnant of. Ancient Rome Indiana the Riddle The mention of Mars and Caesar symbolizes ancient Roman culture it seems that Phantom Thief is showing us that we need to solve it using knowledge of. Ancient Rome We need to replace the numbers with Roman numerals and the letters with the letters from the Roman period. In ancient Rome, there were no letters J, U, and W. In other words, the order of numbers for the 20th letter in the alphabet is not T but V. When we use Roman numerals, its actual value is the number 5. 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4 foot means V multiplied by C equals D, which solves 5 multiplied by 100 equals 500, a perfect match. At this point, Dick suddenly understood, and his thoughts became clear. If 20 multiplied by 3 equals 4, then I will visit at a non-existent time. When Mars passes its tenth day and night, following the guidance of Caesar, I shall come to claim the blood-stained egg. If the intention of the first sentence is Roman numerals, then the non-existent time mentioned in the second line means midnight because there is no zero in Roman numerals. Without further explanation from Barbara, Dick solved the meaning of the following sentence. Looking at the first three lines together, Phantom Thief will move at midnight on March 11th, which is 12 o'clock on March 10th. At this point Dick frowned. But what does following the guidance of Caesar mean? I haven't figured out this sentence yet if this sentence is just meant to guide us to focus on ancient Roman related knowledge. Then it seems unnecessary because mentioning Mars would serve the same purpose. After hearing this, Dick nodded in agreement. He also felt that this sentence was not just a simple hint. But, Barbara suddenly changed the subject. After coming to the Natural History Museum, I think I understand what he means. Inside the ancient Rome exhibition hall, Barbara looked at a sculpture of Julius Caesar, and her eyes flashed with a hint of understanding. The statue of Julius Caesar appeared as if he were pointing towards the enemy when he was leading the army. If Barbara remembered correctly, the direction the statue was pointing should be towards the jungle exhibition hall on the east side of the museum, where the dragon egg ruby necklace is located. Are you suggesting that Caesar's guidance is just an actual guide and that Phantom Thief will carry out his plan at midnight on March 10th in the Jungle Exhibition Hall? After listening to Barbara's thoughts, Dick asked with doubt. I know it sounds a bit direct, but at least for now, it's the only explanation that makes sense I haven't found any other guidance of Caesar here. Barbara shook her head and sighed. All right, it seems that there is no other way to solve the puzzle in short. The time will never be wrong. 
After thinking for a while, they realized that this was really only one explanation. Dick nodded, agreeing with Barbara's thoughts. So far, the two of them have deciphered the entire content of Phantom Thief's notice letter. After discussing some details of the follow-up arrangements, Dick ended his call with Barbara. At that moment, Dick suddenly heard someone calling his name from ahead. Hey, Dick, Dick, snap out of it. Mrs. Anderson is coming to find you. Dean was calling his name softly while all the classmates looked at him with amused eyes. Dick's heart skipped a beat as he instantly realized something was wrong. It seems you've finally come to your senses. Mr. Grace and I called your name four times already, and you did not respond at all. I have to question whether your attitude towards learning is good. A deep voice from a middle-aged woman came from beside him. Dick's face immediately stiffened as he looked up and met Mrs. Anderson's gloomy expression. Mrs. Anderson was their math teacher and had a bad temper. Dick realized that the situation was not good. He had been too focused on discussing the notice letter with Barbara and completely missed being called. Can you give me a reasonable explanation, Mr. Grayson? Mrs. Anderson asked slowly and deliberately, her eyes filled with pressure. Dick's face broke into a cold sweat as he forced a smile and said, A uh, Mrs. Anderson. I was just listening to your class and got completely immersed in the world of mathematics until a few seconds ago. Mrs. Anderson stared into his eyes without any expression. What you said can only deceive yourself, not anyone else I think I'll have to confiscate your earphones now, and if you get distracted again, I'll have to talk seriously with Mr. Wayne about your education. After finishing speaking, Mrs. Anderson took away Dick's earphones without any further words and returned to the stage. Author's note. Help me guys reach heaven and keep sending me power stones, winky face. Patreon.com slash Sothisk. You can find up to 20 advanced chapters on my Patreon. 2. Chapter 46. The Riddler. Next. Humans aren't made perfectly everyone lies even so. I've been careful not to tell lies that hurt others. Like Yagami. Ha 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 ha. As Mrs. Anderson left, Dick heard a burst of laughter around him. He knew that his classmates were laughing at him because his earphones had been taken away. Luckily, he had just finished his call with Barbara, or else it would have caused even more trouble. Of course, if the call hadn't ended, Dick wouldn't have let Mrs. Anderson take away the earphones. With Dick's reaction, he could have removed the earphones before Mrs. Anderson touched them. It's just that there is no need for that now, and it's not a big deal if the earphones are taken away. Hey, what were you listening to that got you so immersed? Dean turned around and quietly asked. A nothing special, just a few new rock songs. Dick scratched the back of his head and laughed. Really? I never knew you liked rock. Dean glanced at Dick with his usual expression and warned, Be careful, Mrs. Anderson has her eyes on you. After speaking, he turned around and sat straight. No one noticed that there was a chewing gum-like object in Dean's hand. That's right. While Mrs. Anderson was taking away Dick's headphones, Dean quietly took back the bug stuck on the back of the table with lightning speed. He had almost heard the entire conversation between Dick and Barbara. From his suspicions about his own identity to the solving of the notice letter, Dean already knew everything. The only downside was that he couldn't hear Barbara's voice, so he couldn't be sure who he was talking to. In any case, it must be one of Batman's people, either the butler Alfred or the Batgirl, whose true identity is still unknown. In short, they have already started to suspect me as the Phantom Thief, and Dick's level of suspicion towards me is not too deep, which means the person he was talking to is the one who truly suspects me. But they probably don't have any evidence to identify me, they are still just guessing otherwise. Dick's attitude wouldn't be like this. Dean thought to himself, in their next move, they will surely try to test me. Meanwhile, deep inside Arkham Asylum, in a cell with heavy iron doors tightly locked and high-strength iron bars added to the windows. Two men, one tall and one short, sit facing each other. The tall, skinny man's hands are handcuffed to the table, restricting his movement. He's also wearing orange inmate clothing. Clearly, he must be a mentally ill criminal who's been imprisoned here. What's strange is that there is no number written on his inmate clothes instead. There's a mysterious question mark symbol drawn on it. Sitting opposite him was a short... Chubby man with a long, pointed nose, dressed in a tuxedo and holding an umbrella cane. In Gotham City, there is only one person who fits this description. Penguin, Oswald Cobblepot. In the dimly lit cell, the faces of the two men are barely visible, giving off a sinister and terrifying vibe. An indescribable chill affects the entire room, 
which makes the two fully armed guards disguised as nurses standing at the door shiver. Well, Nigma, any idea? After a long time, the penguin was the first to speak, mentioning a name that would surely strike fear into the hearts of every Gotham citizen. Edward Nigma, standing at six feet two inches tall and thirty-five years old, is a highly intelligent supervillain suffering from a severe mental illness. He is extremely narcissistic about his own intelligence and enjoys using his high IQ to manipulate others. But rather than being called by his real name, he prefers to be called a Riddler. Not long ago, Penguin visited Arkham Asylum to visit the Riddler. At first, the people in charge of the asylum didn't want to let in another notorious criminal. However, all the necessary government documents were in order, so the institution had no reason to keep him outside. The condition was that he could only enter alone and without any personal belongings. At the same time, he had two prison guards or, I mean, nurses, who were always with him and never left his side. When Penguin came to see to face with the Riddler, he asked him a few questions, hoping that the Riddler could help him figure out their meaning. That's right, it was the notice letter from the Phantom Thief since he couldn't bring any items into Arkham. Penguin could only talk about it with Riddler. Penguin is pressuring Mrs. Chandler to hold an exhibition to seek revenge against the Phantom Thief. If he knows the Phantom Thief's next move, he can set up a perfect trap and take him down on the spot. There's just one problem the Phantom Thief's notice is too difficult to decipher. Barbara was able to decipher the notice because she happened to remember a book that Dean had read that day, which inspired her. Otherwise, Barbara's progress might not be any faster than Dick's, and she would still be stuck on the line Mars past its tenth day and night. For most people, without the important hints, it's almost impossible to figure out how to decipher the notice and Penguin was no exception. However, Penguin isn't worried about not being able to solve the notice because he has his own way. If he can't figure it out, he'll have someone else do it. So Penguin approached Riddler, who in his opinion, is the best person in the world at riddles. At this moment, Penguin is eagerly waiting for Riddler's response. Interesting. This riddle is very interesting, and I like it. Who came up with it? Seeing Riddler close his eyes and think, a crazy joy slowly appeared on his face as if he were a child who had just received his favorite toy. Penguin didn't understand his joy, and he didn't want to understand he just wanted to know what the notice meant. I'm glad you like the gift I brought you, old friend. So now please tell me, have you figured out this riddle? Penguin asked. Oh, hearing this, Riddler suddenly changed his face and sneered disdainfully. When I say it's interesting, I mean the design of this puzzle makes me feel fresh not because I think it's difficult. In fact, if I were to rate it according to difficulty, it wouldn't even qualify as a decent riddle in my eyes. The time is midnight on March 10th. The location I if it really is the Natural History Museum. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the Jungle Exhibition Hall. The Riddler quickly revealed all the answers to Penguin. I won't bother explaining the reason to you, Oswald, as I know you don't care. Penguin grinned and said, You're still as smart as ever I only need the result the process is not important. I'm glad to see you today, old friend, but visiting hours are over, so I have to go now. Wait. Riddler stopped Penguin and fixed his gaze on him, asking, Tell me, who is this person? He calls himself Phantom Thief, a thief who likes to show off. Penguin turned slightly and replied with his eyes with a hint of killing intent, which fell into the eyes of Riddler, but it was not directed at him. You don't need to take this person seriously, Nigma, because ten days from now, you won't have the chance to meet him again. Author's note, keep supporting me guys and drop Power Stone, we will reach the heavens someday in joy. Patreon.com slash You can find up to 20 advanced chapters at my Patreon. 1.